Can you guys hear me okay? I can. Outstanding. And did I turn my, no, I didn't turn my video on. Now you should be able to see me as well as hear me. I'm trying to figure out if there's too much glare on the whiteboard. If there is, I'll put the full shade down. So if, uh, when we get to the whiteboard stuff, if there's too much glare, somebody let me know and I will uh, pull that shade down. That should help. So last week, last week, it's as if our last lecture was a week ago. This, this would be a graduate class then. Last time, which I think was 24 hours, no, 24 plus three, 27 hours ago or so, we said that the power of the cut equals what? So is the power equal? Somebody turn off your mic and talk, or turn on your mic. What is the power equal? It was. Uh... Say again. AP times W times C times Q. KP times W times C times Q. My, my daughter's in seventh grade and I was helping her with her math assignment yesterday. And she said, I really hate it when they put the dot between the things instead of the time symbol. I said, you better get used to it. Right? I said, in fact, engineers and scientists, if it's multiplication, they usually don't even call the dot, right? Because we know that means multiplication. So, Power of the cut should be equal to this material constant is a material constant. W, that was the sharpness factor, right? Or the tool factor. Now I call it tool sharpness. The reason it's a W because the people that invented the equation called it the tool wear factor. But I'm gonna call it the sharpness factor because I think it, it makes more sense. The C. Forgive is, me, but wasn't Q the material removal rate? We haven't gotten to that one yet. That's Q. So the C is the speed factor. Then what is material cost? Oh, constant. I thought constant. this was material cost. A and T. I'll try to finish spelling it. Material cost. Is okay, that. I thought that said material cost. So I was like, wait a minute here. What the yeah. hell does that have to do with power? That is that is kind of tough. And then our Q, just the one on the screen it is. Q, which is our material removal rate. And again, this is the volumetric material removal rate. We take the area that we're removing for each for each pass and we multiply that by the, the length based unit for the feed rate. And so if it's a turning operation, it's feed per uh, feed per feed in inches per revolution. And if it's a um, milling operation, what inches per revolution or inches per minute? I don't know, you gotta make the units cancel. Forgive me, but why right. are there two, you wrote over the first, why are there two Qs? There's only one Q. What's at the top? This is a P, P equals KP. No, so the material K. constant. KP is material constant, W is tool sharpness. It's KP, it looked like Q yeah. from here. Oh. This is why I'm an engineer and not an artist. Fair enough. AP. All right. So if we know something about the material, the tool, the speed, and again, this is the, the, the power at the tool cutting edge. 
So I've got my tool here. I've got my work piece. I've got a chip that's going off this way. Chip. I've got a work piece. The work piece is going this way, which means the tool is going this way because all velocity is relative, right? We've got our velocity there. It's the new surface that's being made. And here's where the cutting is happening through here. Right. So this is the chip forming on the edge of the tool. So this is the power that's happening right here where the chip is forming on the edge of the tool. And we get this, and we can estimate what that will be because we know it has to be related to the workpiece material. We think it should be related to the, the sharpness of the tool. So this radius here at the edge of the tool, it should be related to that. That just intuitively makes sense to us. Uh, experimentally, they found out that how fast the tool is moving. So this velocity factor here impacts the, the number. And of course, the material removal rate is really just a measurement of how much chip is happening while we do the cut. So we can estimate these things. How do we know the value for KP, for W, and for C? So I, I told you yesterday that you believe I proved to you yesterday that we can estimate the power it takes to make the chip. How do we know the values of those factors? Go ahead and, and speak up or let's see if I can get the chat window back up. All right, so Matthew says we could learn that from testing. And absolutely, we could design an experiment and we could do a series of tests with different materials, different feed rates, different material removal rates, and different sharpnesses of tool. And, and if you do the same experiment over time, the tool will become less sharp. So you can just use one tool and as it wears out, you can monitor how much it has worn out. And so we can do that experiment. Do you guys have time to do experiments before your next homework is due? Probably not. So if you don't have time to do the experiment before your next homework is due, where else could you find out the information? Somebody unmute yourself and speak up. It would be in some kind of table. You could look it up in a table. Has anybody ever applied for a job? Um, in the participants thing, say yes, if you've ever applied for a job. Are you including like menial jobs? Like I don't care. Have you ever applied for a job? There's only 23 of you here. Wow, it usually takes longer in the term for the participation to get down to 23. So only half of you have ever applied for a job? Oh, wait, wait, some of the people are taking their yeses away. I thought the poll was over, I put it back. So has anybody ever thought about applying for a job? So either you've applied for a job or you've thought of applying for a job, say yes. Or you could just unmute and say yes. If so, just keep it up still. If we have applied for a job, keep it up. If you've thought, if you've done it, you've probably thought about it. Yeah, fair enough. So say yes if you've applied for a job. All right. You can take your yes away now, but only if the answer is no to the next question. Have you ever looked at a job listing for an engineering position? So you don't have to have applied for it, but have you read the listing? 
to Devin. You said you've looked at a listing for a job application. What's something that's uh, for a listing for a job for an engineering position? What's something that stood out to you? Can you unmute and tell us? If you're in the, um, the qualifications. Qualifications, right? So people that get jobs as engineers, they have qualifications. Um, what, anything, oh, now the people that don't want to talk are taking their yeses away. Julia. Julia, can you remember any of the qualifications that were required for this engineering job? I had to know SolidWorks. You had to know SolidWorks. So you had to know some technical thing. Um, Alyssa, can you remember anything besides knowing some technical information like SolidWorks or how to use Excel or something like that? Right now, a few of them require a certain GPA. So some of them require a certain GPA. So you've been looking at jobs for people that hire straight out of college. I remember when I graduated. And so when I graduated, my undergraduate degree it was a down job market. And I remember I used to, uh, I used to, I didn't want to buy the newspaper. Back when I graduated, there were not a lot of websites with job postings. If you want to know about the jobs, you had to get the newspaper and you had to go through the help wanted section of the newspaper. And, and I remember I didn't want to pay for the Sunday paper because the Sunday paper was like 275, three bucks or something like that. And so what I would do is I would go to the bean counter, I would buy a cup of coffee, and then I would get a copy of the Sunday paper that somebody had left laying around and I would go to the, the help wanted section and I would scan through it and I would write down the job thing on my notebook and the phone numbers and stuff like that. And one of the things, by the way, the CIA was advertising to hire people in the Boston Globe when I graduated from college. I thought about applying, but that just seemed like weird, like the CIA was advertising to hire people in the newspaper. Um, but one of the things for the engineering jobs that I was looking at that was amazing to me was the fact that they all required five years experience. Has anybody seen that? You want to get an engineering job, it requires five years experience. Does anybody know why? to go through training while you're there? So <clears throat> when you graduate from college, you know things, right? Well, it's my wish that when you graduate from college, you know things. And I think you believe you know things when you graduate from college. But a lot of engineering is looking stuff up in a reference manual. And I believe the reason for the five years experience rule that I saw in all these jobs was the fact that if you already had worked for a company for five years, they had already purchased for you all the books that you needed. And therefore you had the book and you could look stuff up now and I don't have to buy the book for you if you're my new employee. I don't know if that's true or not, but it was my theory. But, uh, but the place where we're gonna find the, the, uh, the KP values and the C values and the Q values and the W values is from the machinery's handbook. Other people have done the testing and the studies that, uh, that we need to do. Now, the good news for you is you don't have to go to the bookstore and pay $150,000 for the book because it's available to you electronically at the WPI library. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you how to get access to it. I can remember how. Share screen. Um, I will share this one. And then I will create a new tab on this one and drag it over. All right. Amazing. All right. So if you'd like to look at the machinery handbook, and you will need to look at the machinery handbook in order to answer the questions on this week's quiz. You should go to, I don't know, 
WP, I can't spell, PI library. WPI library. Look at that. Board. What chapters on the machinery manual are we going to need? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll give you some information. Okay. On what you need because. Is it possible for you to get a link on Canvas or are we going to need to like get the yeah, yeah. person? I'll, I'll add that to the information. Um, go to Thank the you. library. Search for Machinery's Handbook. And amazingly enough, it comes up. And oh, this is the 26th edition, 28th edition. The one I held up is the 30th edition. The physics of chip formation hasn't changed in the past ever. The physics hasn't changed. I'm pretty sure you could go back to, let's see what the old one I have. I'm pretty sure you could, you could go back to the ninth edition, which is the oldest one I have and find the same information. The page numbers might be slightly different. Oh, um, something to ask. I think I might've asked this way earlier, but forgot it. Are, do we have any exams in this class? There will be a final exam in the last week. Other than that, we have quizzes, homeworks, and the lab assignments. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so I'm gonna go to the online version of the 30th edition, which I believe is the most recent one in print of the Machinery's Handbook. Click on where it says available online. And it brings you to this thing and click again, available online. So oh, then you gotta click on the Novell thing. And then it opens up the table of contents. You can scroll through this to find the section you're looking for. In the summer, I got an email from the library that says they were discontinuing their subscription to this database with these electronic books. I complained to them and said, hey, I give that as a signed reading in my class. You can't discontinue it. They said it's really expensive and we're gonna discontinue it. And it doesn't seem like they have yet. So this will work at least for now. It may go away later. If it does, we'll work something else out. The library did promise me that they would keep at least access to one of these. So if it's not during this homework assignment, it'll probably be okay if there's only one or two available to the library. And you can always come into the lab. We have a lot of them available in the lab in the paper version. But uh, what we're interested in in the machinery's handbook right now is estimating feed speed and power in machining. If we scroll through the table of contents, machining operations, cutting speeds and feeds, speeds and feeds tables, estimating speeds and machining power. So if we go to that section, and if I zoom in, look at that, I even know how to zoom. Um, so it's a good idea to read through the section of the book before just using the numbers in the tables. But I just want to explain to you that if we scroll down here, so they're talking about sawing, now we get to machining power. And so we get these KP values. And so there's KP values published if you're doing your calculations using inches and pounds and feet. There are KP values published if you're doing your calculations using metric units. So depending on what the units are in the example problem, you're gonna to wanna to use the correct KP value. Um, but if you go through these, it, it talks about the different materials. Um, and there's different types of ways to identify alloys and stuff. The ones we're gonna be looking at mostly are KP values, here we go. So there's plain carbon steels. We might do some of that. KP values, where's my aluminums and stuff? I should have practiced this before I started. Anyway, there's KP values for the different materials that we're gonna be using. 
the W factors, so it depends if you're doing turning, milling, drilling, broaching, planing, or shaping on which W factor you want to use. Um, now, if the tool you're using is wearing out, you have to understand that the W factor is going to go up. But in a turning operation with a, uh, a sharp cutting tool, it's likely that your W factor is going to be one or very close to one. If it's a really, what well, they call it, extra heavy duty rough turning. Now, this is kind of a judgment call when you're the machinist or the engineer setting this up. But this is the time when you know you're at risk of the spindle slowing down because you have too much power um, and you're making giant chips and, and you're really just trying to get rid of a lot of material quickly. But, um, but in all the example problems we use, we'll, we'll tell you which type of, uh, of exercise it is. So you look up the factors here. Um, again, let's see here. So our efficiency factors is gonna depend on the type of machine tool, the way it's operated, we'll, we'll talk to you there. Now this material removal rate, now you intuitively know how to figure out the material removal rate. But if you forget, you can look up the equations depending on which kind of operation it is and you can do the calculations for your material removal rate based on the equations. Um, and if you go through this, you can figure out the powers, do all that. Now, in order to answer the questions here, you may have to go back from this page and look up information in the reference tables. And as you go through this, you'll, you'll see how that works. But people have already done these experiments. You don't have to do them. That's great for you. Even if you wanted to do these experiments, I'm not sure there's a good way. Oh, you could, if you, as long as you had the cash and you could buy all the machines and the materials and stuff. But I, I, I don't know anybody that's doing direct research right now in figuring out these numbers, except for maybe new materials. Um, all right. So stop the screen share. Okay, so you can go to the machinery's handbook to look up these reference values. I'll make sure I give you links. I've also got videos that tell you how to search the machinery handbook. I'll put a link to that and I'll, I'll tell you which sections to look at in the individual quiz questions. So reference this section of the machinery's handbook in order to, uh, to find this out. So we can estimate the power it takes to make the cut, the power at the edge of the chip and the chip tool interface, we can, we can estimate that based on looking up values from our tables. And, and our estimates are, again, only as good as our assumptions, but, uh, but it gives us a good idea. And that's important. Why, why, again, do we care about estimating the power? What's the downside of, of needing too much more power than is available? Somebody shouted out while I'm erasing the board here. It could uh, damage the machine. So we can damage the machine, we can damage the workpiece, we can damage the tool, we can do all three, right? So there is definitely a downside of needing more power than we have. Now let's take a step back a little bit. What is power? As an engineer, we should know the units of the things we're talking about. So if you can't tell me what is power, can you tell me what, the, what are the units for power? Can somebody shout out, what is power? It's work over an elapsed time. So power is work over time. We know we can estimate it if we know stuff about the materials and the cutting conditions. And we know that it is work over time. What's work? I mean, all right, so school work is sometimes boring, sometimes interesting, sometimes a pain in the ass. But what is all work? Somebody shout out. 
Force times distance. Work is force times distance. So power equals force times distance over time. What's distance over time? Speed. Distance over time is velocity, right? So power equals force times velocity. And it equals KP times Q times W times C. Well, that's cool. Now we have two things power equals to. Now we can solve equations, right? We could find unknowns if we have two equations and one unknown, right? So power equals force times velocity. Now, it's the power of the chip, or it's the power that it takes to create the chip. And so when we're creating the chip, we've got our tool, and it's here, there's a cutting edge on the tool. The chip flows off in that direction. We've got workpiece material here. New workpiece material here, right? So this is the tool. This is the workpiece. This is the chip. Chip's going that way. Workpiece materials going that way. The tool is going that way. And the tool is going that way at ex exactly the same velocity as the workpiece material is going that way, except when there's acceleration, right? So if we limit ourselves to looking at the steady state condition, this workpiece velocity has the same magnitude as this tool velocity. So let's just think about, so we can think about one of them or the other. So let's just think about the tool velocity going through the workpiece. What's the velocity? We drew the same picture yesterday and I asked the same question and somebody knew the right answer. What's the velocity equal to? Wasn't it surface speed? The velocity is the surface speed. Now, there are rare conditions where there's no rotational velocity and there's only feed rate, in which case the surface speed equals the feed rate. But in almost all instances that we care about, the surface speed comes entirely from the rotation of the workpiece and turning or the rotation of the tool in milling. So we almost always discount the contribution of feed towards surface speed when we do this. Now we have, interestingly enough here, some things we can consider. We've got this T1 here, which is what we call the uncut chip thickness. So this is the amount of material that's about to become chipped. It's not chipped yet because it's over here in the workpiece. Over here, there's a shearing zone. That's where the cutting has happened. And over here, we have a chip. And we have a T2, which is the chip thickness. What else is interesting about the diagram, the way we've drawn it? What else could you possibly want to know? Let me go ahead and share the screen here for a second. It's a, this, this diagram on the shared screen, it looks like the diagram I drew on the whiteboard, right? We've got a tool, we've got a chip, we've got an uncut chip thickness, we've got a chip thickness. 
Now, if I play this video and that's queued up correctly, let's watch the tool going through the workpiece material. And so this is a turning exercise. The, the video is, I, I copied it off a DVD that probably came off of film at one point, but we're doing a turning exercise on the part. When we zoom in with a microscopic camera, this is what that looks like, right? So the tool is moving through the workpiece material. The chip is forming, if I pause here, right in this area. So this is 90 degrees rotated from the diagram I drew. You guys can visualize that. So this area is chip. This is the uncut chip thickness here. The velocity of the tool is in this direction. And so as we go through there, we can see now the, um, the chip is thicker than the uncut chip thickness. Just a second, oh, this takes too long. Oh, I go label stuff here, that's what I do. Yeah, I label the stuff and then I rotate it around. You know, of all the YouTube videos I've posted and I've been posting YouTube videos, since YouTube was like a new thing. And people that post YouTube videos, they crave views. I don't know if you knew that, but of all the YouTube videos I've ever posted, this is the most watched video. I literally played the video from a DVD in like on the screen and did a screen capture of the screen to make this video. And then I cut it off and I did some animations using PowerPoint. So clearly I'm not a YouTube influencer or creator, but maybe this video will be the one that takes me to the top. All right, so we've got our chip thickness, our uncut chip thickness. What else could vary in this besides that uncut chip thickness and the velocity and the way we've drawn the diagram? So we've got independent variables and dependent variables. What else could we change besides the uncut chip thickness? Because we can change the uncut chip thickness. That's our choice. We can change the velocity. We can change the workpiece material and all that stuff. But for each workpiece material, what else could we change in this diagram of each shot? We could change the angle of the tool. You change the angle of the tool. Of course, the sharpness of the tool and stuff like that, right? But but really changing the sharpness of the tool simply dynamically changes the angle of the tool at that point where the tool first intersects the part, right? So you see, if you make if you make it bigger radius or a smaller radius right at this point, what that's effectively doing is it's changing this angle locally where you're doing that. And so we can change this angle, which we measure from the vertical, and we call that the rake angle. And so we could change the rake angle, we could change the uncut chip thickness, and we could change the velocity. And all of those things will have a tendency to change this plane. So if I change the rake angle, it's going to end up making this, if I make the rake angle closer to zero, it'll make this plane go more like that for the chip formation. If I make the chip thickness thicker, so the uncut chip thickness thicker, it'll make this be longer. It'll change the size of the plane where the chip is forming. Now, all of the energy that goes into making the chip goes into making the chip in that plane. So if you make the plane bigger, the energy required goes up. If you make the plane smaller, the energy required goes down. And so that's an important intuitive thing to think about. Now it turns out that, is it too much background noise right now? There is, oh, uh, it's just the lifty thing. They're, they're moving some heavy boxes off the top of the new building back down to the ground. So it's like, a, it looks like a, 
a man lift, except it's got a big backhoe bucket on the front of it. That's what's going on outside my window. All right, so the power is happening right here. We know that power equals force times velocity, right? And so the power is happening right here. It's force times velocity. If we want to multiply a force times a velocity, they have to be lined up with each other, right? So to do that, we've got a force here. FC, that's the cutting force. Now, is that the only force between the tool and the workpiece chip area? The chip, remember, is sliding along this rate face over here, right? So in order to apply this force, we have to do it in line with the direction of motion. But there's also a thrust force because this chip wants to pull the tool away from the workpiece, which means our, our machine tool has to be pushing the tool down towards the workpiece. And so we've got a thrust force here. So we've got our cutting force and we've got our thrust force. If you add those two together, you guys know how to do vector addition, right? You just take one and put it at the other end and draw the new line. So you guys know how to do vector addition. If we add the cutting force, so this one is the cutting force, FC. This one is the thrust force, FT, because we're engineers, we're not poets, FC, FT. For some reason, we call the resultant force P. I don't know why, but it's in all the literature, it's in all the textbooks, so we're gonna call it P. The resultant force is P. So cutting force plus thrust force equals the resultant force, and that's the total force that the tool is exerting on the chip or the workpiece, depending on which one you want to pay attention to. Is that fair? Have we all drawn a free body diagram before? If someone's brain completely farts, there are places where we can review vector addition, right? Um, I yeah. know I've done it, but I also have an address. Right direction. But you won't, you won't have to do that much of it in this class. But, uh, but basically, if I take this one and I move it down here and I connect that point back to the origin for both of them, that's how you add those two vectors together. Um, and so it's just the simple, I got, I got one component that goes in the X direction, one component that goes in the Y direction, and my, and you guys can see my legs. But if you could, you would notice that my, my leg was pointing the P vector there. All right. So that's cool because we know velocity. And if we know velocity, oh, wait. Could we know what the FC is if we're doing a machining operation? How could I know what the FC value is? Or, or actually, I guess not the FC, but the P. Power equals force times velocity. We know power equals force times velocity because it has to, the units cancel correctly. Could I know the power from a particular machining operation? I can, because it can measure the current going to the spindle. Now there's other ways I could do it. I could put a force sensor underneath the tool or underneath the workpiece. But the simplest way is I can measure the power going to the spindle. So if I know the power, and I know the velocity, and I know the velocity because I told the machine what velocity to use, I can find that FC, can't I? So that's kind of cool, so that's nice. The chip, if we go back to the video, if we go back to the video, come on. Not this part of the video, that's boring. All right, so you see the chip sliding along 
It's a, this, is, this is the rake face of the tool that the chip's sliding along. You see the chip sliding along the rake face of the tool. Every, now, when I do this in the classroom, I make everybody stand up before we do this part of the class. So everybody stand up. Some of you are on video. Everybody stand up. This is a good time to turn off your video camera, right? All right, so I'm going to assume now that okay, there's a lot of video cameras turned off. I'm going to assume now that everybody's standing up. Take your hands and place them together. Rub them like this. Can you see me? I'll turn off the screen share. But you know what I mean when I say rub your hands like this. It means rub them like this, right? What happens when you rub your hands together like this? Somebody that has not talked today, unmute yourself oh. and talk. Friction. Say again, friction, right? Friction. Your hands warm up. They warm up because of friction. That heating up of your hands, it takes energy, right? So there's energy going into this, this chip tool interface right here. There's got the energy going in there, right? Which means as the chip slides along the tool, there must be a friction force that the chip is exerting on the tool. Is that true? What does friction equal? If you want to calculate friction, what does friction equal? Normal force times coefficient of friction. So friction equals the normal force times coefficient of friction. What direction is the friction force always? Opposite the motion. It's always opposite the motion. So if the chip is moving this way, the friction force must be this direction. And there must be a normal force to cause the friction force. But when I add the friction force and the normal force together, they must equal P. Just like the cutting force and the thrust force must equal P. So the, the, the machine tool is providing the cutting force and the thrust force, right? Those are the servo motors in the machine tool that are pushing the axes in the different directions. That's providing the cutting force and the thrust force. The chip sliding on the tool is causing that friction force to exist. And there must be a normal force. So the friction force, we label that F. Because again, we're engineers, not poets. And F sort of sounds like friction. And the normal force, again, engineers, we call that M. So there's a friction force and a normal force. Of course, when I look at it sideways, it looks like a Z. But believe me, it's an N, not a sideways Z. Those have to add together to equal P. But what else is interesting in our chip tool interaction here? Let me get rid of all these extra shear planes that don't actually exist. But what we really care about is the fact that the chip is forming, right? If there was no chip formation, the tool would just explode. Since there is chip formation, what we really care about is the fact that the chip is forming. In order for this, this workpiece material over here, does it even know that it's moving relative to the tool? The workpiece material over here is just sitting there minding its own business until it gets to the area where it's affected by the tool. It doesn't even know that it's moving. So as the tool comes along and the workpiece material bit over here gets to where the tool interaction is happening, the, the, um, 
the structure of the material is changed. And you're, you're doing some plastic deformation. You're pushing those, those um, um, what's the word, crystals, the metal crystals or, or the, the material, you're pushing those pieces together and you're jamming them together. If we look at the video again, you can really see how that's happening. I got a screen share. If you look at the video again, you can really see how that's happening. Over here, this material has no idea there's a tool coming. And you see in the shape of the, of the structures here in the um, microscopic view, here they're all squished and flattened. Has anybody in the class ever bent or broken a piece of metal? Probably. Right? It takes energy to do that. And what we're doing with our tool is we're, we're squishing the actual material that the metal is made out of. We're changing the shape of it. That takes a lot of energy, which means in our cut, there's a lot of forces happening that are aligned with this shear plane. If we do that, if we draw that, we call it the shear force. So there's a shear force there, and that has to add to the other. You guessed it. The force that's normal to the shear, um, and we call that F of the shear force. They have to add together to equal B because the only thing we're adding to the system is the total force, the resultant force P. And we're looking at steady state. There's no acceleration. We're adding this force P to the system. So S plus Fn has to be P. F plus N has to equal P, plus T has to equal P. All right, so that's the basic relationship. And those are, I mean, I suppose you could draw another force system off in another direction here. It's still out of the normal force to that, add together even P. But the ones that we really care about are the one that lines up with this great case of the tool with the friction force. The one that lines up with the shear plane, which is the shear force, and the one that lines up with the velocity, which is the cutting force. So those all have to add together to equal this P. And so this is what we call orthogonal force systems. And orthogonal force systems are great. Because if we know the angles, so here we've got a rake angle. We know the angle here. We can determine the angle between the friction here and the vertical because that's it's equivalent to the rake angle. You can also determine the angle between the friction and the normal force. We call it the friction angle. So these things, we know the angles. We can figure out the shear angle here. And one way we can figure it out is by doing the experiment with the video camera and the, magna, uh, the, the microscope at the edge of the tool. And we could actually measure that shear angle, which is what we do in this video that we've been looking at. Now we can also calculate what the shear angle must be by looking at the turning operation. But if we know, Maybe. we can move from one orthogonal force system to an <coughs> Other, and we can understand something about the friction that's happening. We can understand something about the shear angle that's happening. And so that's sort of the cool thing about understanding these forces in manufacturing. So let me see what the next couple slides show here. Will we be calculating such things as that angle um, in our quizzes or our quiz? This is calculating such things like that. But huh? don't worry. Remember how I said engineers need experience and they need to have a lot of books in order to be able yep. to do this? Yep. So I have lists of equations for you that help you do this so you don't have to provide all of the equations yourself. All right, that's nice. So, uh, 
So let's just look at, all right, so we, we talked about this. I drew that on the board, shear angle. I wanna put this slide up, switch over so I don't have to draw the picture. Where is shear screen? All right, so this is basically the diagram that I drew on the board, except when I did it this time, it was a Sunday morning. I was sipping coffee. I was playing with my new tablet with the stylus and the new art program. I'm uh, trying to figure out how to draw pictures to explain this stuff. And so we've got our, our rake angle. We see that measured there. We've got our uncut chip thickness. We've got our chip thickness and we've got a shear angle. Now it turns out it is possible to prove mathematically. And once I gave as an extra credit assignment to the class, Prove this mathematically, and I don't know, 15, 16 people did the proof out of the 72 people. Um, unfortunately, the way I stated the question, I didn't define it precisely enough. So there was more than one way to prove that it was true, which meant not only did their example have to match my proof, which I had done before I made the assignment, but it I also had to check to make sure anything that they said was true or not true before I could grade it. And it was ninth grade the last time I was doing proofs in math. And I gotta say, I didn't enjoy it in ninth grade and I don't enjoy it today. So we're not gonna have that assignment, but we could prove mathematically that the tangent of the shear angle equals the ratio of the chip thicknesses times cosine of alpha divided by one minus the ratio of the chip thicknesses times the sine of alpha, where the ratio is T1 over T2. <clears throat> and, and I've done it. You could do it if you want to channel that ninth grade U. Um, but this is true. And you can just show it from the geometry of the diagram that, that shear angle, tangent of shear angle equals RT cosine alpha divided by one minus RT sine alpha. So that's pretty cool. Because if we can do that and we know the angle, we know the uncut chip thickness, because we set that as a, as a process variable, how do we find out the chip thickness? It's really simple. We open up the door to the lathe and we pick up one of the chips and we measure it. So we do our cutting experiment, we measure one of the chips, we can calculate that um, RT. If we know the RT and we know what the rake angle is, how do we know what the rake angle is? It's really simple. We define the rake angle when we put the tool in the tool holder in the lathe. It doesn't change in the process once you start doing it. So you select the rake angle, you select the uncut chip thickness, you can calculate that shear angle. So that's really cool because now we can use these equations, or we can use the equations we can derive from the orthogonal system if you know the shear angle and the rake angle. Everything else depends on those. And so, yeah, this is just a nicer version of the picture. Come on, friction forces. All right, we talked about these friction forces. So it turns out the, uh, the friction coefficient. So it's, you're not gonna take a block of wood and a board and slide the block of wood down the board and measure the angle at which it slides in order to figure out this friction coefficient. But if you know the friction angle, the tangent of the friction angle equals the friction coefficient. And also the friction force divided by the normal force equals the friction coefficient again. And that's just manipulating the equations. If we want to take the friction angle and we want to know some, and we know the shear angle because we can calculate that, we know the inputs, we can figure out that that tau, so again, tau is that friction angle, equals 45 degrees minus tau over two, or so the shear angle equals 45 degrees minus tau over two plus alpha over two. Again, alpha is the rake angle. So if we know the shear angle, we can calculate the friction angle. So that's pretty cool. Using just vector math and sines and cosines, if we know the friction force and the normal force, 
we can figure out <clears throat> the, uh, the cutting force and the thrust force, but also we can measure the cutting force and the thrust force. So we can measure the cutting force and the thrust force, we can figure out the friction force and the normal force. Professor. Yes. We are five minutes over. Outstanding. Um, there's a bunch more equations. I'm posting today for you a sheet that is slides like this that are ME1800 equations. And it's all the equations that I think we use in the class. So it starts at profit rate and it goes all the way down through the stuff we're gonna be doing at the end of the term. Um, the other thing I'll do is I'm gonna post a video for the, the few people that didn't quite grasp what I intended with the, um, the Excel spreadsheet assignment. We're still working on getting all the grades posted for the Excel spreadsheet thing and for the CAM assignments. Um, that'll take us a little bit longer because we, uh, we don't have the same level of support that we normally do. Um, so we're still working through that, but I will post the video explaining what you may or may not have done wrong in the Excel thing. Um, and as we go through, and the quiz we posted tonight, so, to, so please, the quiz will be posted by six o'clock, sometime before six, between six o'clock and eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Please take a look at the quiz and see if it makes sense so that you can be prepared with questions tomorrow during class. Um, because what I would like you to do is for each quiz question this week, add a sheet to your Excel spreadsheet that can solve that type of question and use your Excel spreadsheet to answer the question, to facilitate making sure that you do that correctly. In addition to the questions, we're gonna give you sample correct inputs and outputs for your quiz. So if, if, it's, uh, if it's calculate, so if it's, you uh, calculate the shear angle, or so you know the friction angle and the rake angle, calculate the shear angle, you can easily put this equation in your Excel spreadsheet. We will give you some that we know calculate correctly so you can test your spreadsheet and make sure it works correctly. Um, so that stuff's all gonna be up by six o'clock tonight. I did add to the online syllabus. I gave you a schedule for what's coming up and we'll get the rest of those details up there. And I think what's gonna work best for the lab discussions for the people who are not on campus, but for the people that are working remote, if we can continue to use this time slot for the rest of the term, I'd like to do that. And so, uh, so if that works for you, let me know and I'll email all you guys to make sure. Uh, because there's a, about, I don't know, seven or nine people that are working remotely this term. And, uh, and I wanna continue to use this time slot for that um, to go through lab stuff with you. If that doesn't work, we'll work something else out or we'll figure it out on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you very much for telling me that I was not over the time. It's easy for me to do that. I like to hear myself talk. And this topic is a little bit interesting to me. If you didn't figure that out. Thanks a lot. I'll see you guys tomorrow at eight. Professor. And then you're like, shit, I kind of want an interior. Uh, where do we submit the ME1800 lab assignment from yesterday? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll include that in the quiz. I'll, I'll add quiz questions. Okay, thank you.